Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, Mike Shane family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zarsk. How y'all doing, ladies? Good, Hi. How are you? Yeah. Well, well, welcome back, Emily. Yes, I'm happy to be back. Thanks for, for letting me come back. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. You're, you're always, always welcome, <laughs> always welcome. So we got an extra special guest today. Um, so without further ado, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. So joining us today is a best-selling author widely known for his international adventure thriller series, Sigma Force. He has sold more than 20 million copies worldwide. And today he joins us to discuss his new thriller, Kingdom of Bones, available tax-free at shopmexchange.com on April 19th. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to James Rollins. Hey. That's very kind. Hey, James. I, I, I hopefully it should have been like a standing ovation. That would have been even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll have to work that into our production budget. It's not that it's not that big. Trust me, it's about 15 bucks. <laughs> But, but James, it's an honor to have you with us today. Can, can you let our viewers know where you're coming to us from? Uh, from snowy Lake Tahoe. Uh, matter of fact, I lost power mm -hmm. about an hour ago, so I was sweating whether my uh, my generator was going to still be you know roaring over my shoulder. But luckily, power came back <laughs> on, so we're good. Oh, man. <laughs> Um, so I'm happy your generator came back on and that you're here with us today. Um, and You've mentioned that your interest in writing came from your love of reading and storytelling as a child. Years later, you transitioned from a full-time career as a veterinarian, um, running a clinic with more than 20 employees to being a full-time author. When did you know it was time to fully pursue your passion for storytelling? Well, it was a slow process. Uh, it confused a lot of people, especially my parents, so, you know, they helped me get through vet school. And then all of a sudden, you know, I started my own career, started my own clinic. And then I was like, no, I'm going to be a writer. Uh, but it was like, I didn't do it immediately. Uh, even my clients became suspicious. Something was up with Dr. Jim. Uh, you know, I had a poster in my lobby, you know, get your cat spayed, get a free book. Uh, so, you know, questions began to arise, you know, Dr. Jim, what are you doing? What's your long-term plan with this writing process? And I always told me you know, for the longest period of time, veterinary medicine was my paycheck. That's how I earned a living. Writing was just a hobby. I was just doing it for the fun of it. I was writing a bunch of short stories that are now safely buried in my backyard, hopefully never see the light of day. But I never <laughs> thought it was going to be a career. I thought, you know, you know, down the line, maybe it'd be really cool to, to maybe switch things around and have uh, my writing be my source of income, my paycheck, and uh, my veterinary career just be a hobby. And uh, I sort of resent when people say former veterinarian because I still actually am I'm licensed. I still practice. I work with a volunteer group that traps feral cats, wild cats, and they bring them to the shelter. And one Sunday a month, I spay and neuter them. Uh, yeah. So basically, all I do now with my veterinary degree is just remove genitalia. But uh, you know, it's a hobby. So apparently, <laughs> I've, I've achieved my goal. Uh, so, so over time, you know, eventually writing became you know busier and more demand of my time and. I've been practicing for 20 years at that point. So I sort of weaned myself off the clinic and now I do write full time. And just like I just uh, do a little bit of volunteer work for my veterinary degree. Yeah, we've well, had such an amazing career. Um, even with jumping in, you know, later in life, we are so excited and glad to have you today because you decided to make such a bold decision. Kingdom of Bones, your new book, it drops April 19th. We had a chance to preview the book, and I think new fans will understand all of the hype after reading this new thriller. We actually have the book trailer, so let's take a look.
man, man, I, that, that's, that's a cool trailer. It, I'm impressed with it. I wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So the trailer kind of gave us a little sneak peek, and, and, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. I, I saw, I saw Africa. I saw some some jungle and and, and some hostage taken or something something going on. But uh, can you kind of tell us the background of the story and, and what what Kingdom of Bones is, is kind of about? Sure. Well, as you might guess from that trailer, it's a, it's a sort of a sprawling jungle epic that starts when sort of all hell breaks loose at a UN relief camp deep in the uh, African Congo. Uh, there, men, women, children are found to be in a dull catatonic state, but the surrounding environment has turned more predatory, more dangerous. It's evolving at a exponential rate. And this phenomenon is not limited to the one village. It's spreading across Africa rapidly, uh, threatening the rest of the world. And to combat this uh, global collapse, this, this big uh, global danger, the heroes of Kingdom of Bones uh, is a team called Sigma Force. They're called in. They must hunt down a secret that's buried in the heart of Africa at a cursed location known as the Kingdom of Bones. Wow, I'm excited. I gotta get that book from you, Kiana. I don't know. You got oh, it yeah. before I did. I'm, I'm a little jealous. <laughs> yeah, VIP status over here. <laughs> um, you began writing the chilling thriller before the pandemic. How much is true about the virus in the book and how did you go about your research during the COVID-19 pandemic? It was very strange to write a book about a virus during a pandemic. Uh, and I, I should clarify that Kingdom of Bones isn't really a pandemic novel per se. Uh, in some ways, it, it's actually more frightening. I've done, I've done pandemic novels in the past, The Seventh Plague, The Sixth Extinction, all sort of dealt with the global pandemic. So I didn't really want to do that again. Uh, so I want to sort of explore the weird biology of viruses. And in the pages of this novel, you're going to find out some shocking details that shed light into what's going on in the current pandemic. And to accomplish that, I talked to virologists, to medical doctors, to evolutionary biologists, both before and during the pandemic. And to try to keep the novel as topical as possible, I had to keep tweaking the novel as I was writing it. This novel took a little bit longer to go from finished product to publication because I had to keep changing the novel as the pandemic unfolded to make sure uh, the information I was putting in the book was accurate. The information I was putting in the book was going to shine a little bit more details about what was happening. So it was very exciting to pull that, to try to, to balance that act between writing this thriller, but also at the same time, you know, giving some information about viruses, about the pandemic. So when I first pitched the novel, I pitched it in the middle of 2019. So COVID wasn't on anybody's radar at that point. And later my editor asked me, you know, Jim, did any of the virologists you were speaking to, did they warn you what was coming? Uh, they didn't. I wish they had. Uh, but what they were telling me prior to that and during that was quite frightening. Uh, trust me, when you're writing a thriller and the you know, pandemic's occurring and you're talking to a virologist that says, you know, I'm terrified what this virus is going to do. Uh, in, in the early stage of the pandemic, you know, people were a little bit lax or there, you know, things weren't really shutting down and people were wondering what's going to happen. But in my other ear, this virologist was like screaming in panic. So it was not the best uh Best it made that my my little seat in my office, you know, get a little bit warmer and a little hotter. Uh, so, you know, what they what they told me uh, is something I, I'd love to share in the novel because I think it's really important to to, to share. That's pretty yeah, cool. Uh, in addition to just kind of to shedding light on, you know, the virus, the book also features a pair of veterans who play an important role in the story: Tucker and his military war dog. Kane, and you even write scenes from the dog's point of view, which is pretty cool. So how did this duo come about? Well, I love Tucker and Kane. Uh, they've helped Sigma in the past. Uh, they've had their own solo adventures also. I, I first had the idea for trying to write this dynamic duo of a handler and his military war dog. Uh, I did a, a USO tour of authors to Iraq and Kuwait in the winter of 2010, just as the war was sort of dying or was uh, just about to end. And uh, me being a veterinarian, you know, I saw handlers working with their dogs. And I was just curious. So I was approached them. So, okay, hey, can I pet your dog? And I said, if you want to lose your hand, sure. Uh, but I got talked to them. I sort of learned what a dynamic relationship 
between handler and dog? And I didn't know, did they just treat the dog like a sidearm? Uh, you know, what was that relationship like? And I found out it was, it was an intimate relationship. You know, these, this pair, they work together, they eat together, they play together. And I kept hearing from these handlers a common phrase. Uh, it was, a, it, it passes down the leash or passes down the lead. And what they were saying is that over time, that bond between dog and handler becomes so intimate that the handler can read the dog, the dog can read the handler without any spoken word, without any, any signal. They just sort of sense each other that their emotions sort of travel up and down that leash. So when I was trying to put that dynamic duo on paper, I didn't want to just write from one end of the leash. I wanted to also go to the other end of the leash and write from the dog's point of view. But I also didn't want to do a, a Disney version of a dog that breaks out in song halfway through the novel. You know, I want to make it authentic <laughs> as possible. So, you know, I, I interviewed handlers. I went to Lackland Air Force Base where they trained the dogs. Uh, I vetted the book uh, in prior appearances of Tucker and Kane and this book to make sure that what Tucker and Kane were doing was accurate. And this is the odd thing that I, I discovered is that when I first wrote Tucker and Kane, I got a lot of feedback from, from readers saying, that's, you know, what Tucker and Kane are doing seems unbelievable. It doesn't seem Kane should be that capable of doing the things that you're, you're describing in this book. And at the same time, from the handlers, they were saying, Jim, we you know, reviewed the book and, and what you're doing is great, but if anything, you're pulling the reins back on what Kane can really do. He can do even more than what you're, what you're you know, showing. So in this case, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. And so mm -hmm. in Kingdom of Bones, I really wanted to, to bring that pair uh, as dynamically forward as I can so that I can really showcase what, those, what that team can do. That's awesome. And so we, we had um, Shannon Tatum on the show and he's promoting his his movie dog about, you know, he, he's in the movie as a as a kind of a military dog handler. And he kind of talked about the same thing about keeping things authentic. Uh, and, and because I know right. us as military members, we're, we're super critical whenever they display military stuff in movies and books and all kind of other stuff. And so we're always like, yeah, you can't do that. And yeah, th that uniform looks all jacked up and this, that. So, you know, I, I, t I told him that he make sure he keeps his military cred up uh, by, by doing it, doing the right th thing by the military when he portrays us in a, in a movie. So uh, we appreciate you for, like you said, going to Lackland and, and really getting in the mind and hearts of, uh, of the actual military members and the, 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 the dogs because they're military members as well. They get, they get full honors and everything exactly. else uh, uh, once once they once they once they do what they do. So uh, we appreciate that and um, look forward to seeing it in the book. So I you, you are. I, I watched the movie Dog also. That was a great movie. I thought they they really did a beautiful job with that relationship. <laughs> awesome. What you got? What you got, Emily? Oh. Um, so James, you've shared so many tips for aspiring writers over the years. Um, and I've actually personally read a lot of like the little question and answers you do online and things like that, uh, which is always fun to read. And uh, what do you believe is the key to writing a hit thriller? Well, first of all, I think it's important that you, know, you construct the biggest roller coaster you can. Uh, you know, you, you need to have those sudden drops of sudden twists and turns that are going to shock the reader, surprise the reader, hold the reader in suspense. But at the same time, uh, you know, no matter how tall of a cliff you build and dangle that character off that cliff, if the reader isn't invested in that character, uh, they're not going to really care whether that character falls or falls off that cliff or not. So it's important balancing between building that roller coaster, but also putting on those that in the, uh, in the on that roller coaster, characters that the readers are going to uh, attach to, feel sympathy for, uh, and hopefully have a strong reaction. You know, I've got some early feedback from Kingdom of Bones that uh, you know, so people say, "Well, it kept me up late at night," but at the same time, by the end of the book, I was crying. So then I know the book worked. You know, at that point, I have the right reaction I want from people. So those are the two things I always sort of struggle between building a great plot, but also for building characters that you know people really glom on to, really attach to. Awesome. So, you, so you're an active supporter of our veterans, and we appreciate that. Uh, and you even earned the Silver Bullet Award for your charitable work uh, from the International Thriller Writers. So what, what inspired you to support our nation's heroes? Well, went back to that the USO tour back in 2010, uh, you know, after coming back there, I knew I wanted to do more, but I wasn't quite sure what to do. Uh, you know, I had supported the veterans in various aspects, sort of slipshod methods, but I, didn't, I wanted to be more organized about it. And so I was approached uh, by USA, USA Cares 
And if you wanted to learn more about their organization, go to usacares.org. Uh, it's a great organization. They said, Jimmy, hey, would you want to be one of our spokespeople to support our organization? And I wasn't, fam- and I wasn't familiar with them, so I thought, well, what you know, what do you do? And what this organization does, they they raise emergency funds for vets that are in uh, dire situations, whether it's uh, needing help with a mortgage payment, helping with travel moving expenses, just you know, helping with a cable bill. Uh, they just put money in pockets of the vets, and they do it really efficiently. For every dollar they raise. 98 cents ends up in a pocket of a, of a veteran. So they have very little overhead. That's why you're not going to see ads on television for USA Cares. They look for spokespeople like me and a few other people out there to help spread the word uh, because they want to keep that, that ratio where all the money they raise ends up going to veterans in need. And I'm, just recently, I joined as a, well, not recently, but now a couple of years, as an advisory board member for us4warriors.org. So us 4 number 4 warriorsorg uh, It started as a grassroots effort out of San Diego and now spreading nationwide. Uh, again, they help with social welfare. Uh, they have a bunch of activities they encourage veterans to participate in. But uh, one thing that's really exciting for me is that they're starting an organization of, of offshoot of the organization where they're encouraging veterans to write their stories, whether it's to uh, just preserve a journal for future generations to share with their family, whether it's the goal is to get published. Uh, you know, our goal is to act as sort of mentors to help guide them through that process. We've had a great success recently with a veteran getting published and even had a movie deal uh, just uh, closed with them. So really excited about that. Being a writer myself, you know, it's, I just love being able to encourage veterans to tell their stories so these stories aren't lost in the fogs of war. Uh, so it's, it's very exciting. It's sort of a grassroots effort, and I'm looking forward to see where that goes. Yeah, I could, yes. for, Oh, no, I just, I, let me let me. I just want to uh, kind of highlight the fact that there's uh, and, and talk to the audience and there's just so many organizations doing great things for our veterans. And so uh, whatever whatever there's a need uh, out there in the world uh, and, and good people like like James, you know, he he's supporting those, these things. But there's just so many different resources out there. So uh, if you need help out there, uh, if you're listening, uh, there's plenty of resources out there for, for anything that you need. So uh, thank you for for bringing that information to, to the forefront. Happy to do so. Thanks so much, James. And you also mentioned wanting and encouraging veterans to kind of share their story. So we have some members of the military community from all over the world watching live right now. What is some advice you would give those aspiring authors in America's armed forces um, when it comes to wanting to share their story within themselves and tap into that skill or that passion? Well, again, a lot of people are intimidated by the thought of writing, and I've encountered this when I've been working as a mentor right now. Uh, and specifically, it's 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 that they don't think they have this, the tools in which to tell their stories. They don't think they have the ability. Well, I've never had any formal training in writing. You know, my goal was to be a veterinarian. That's what I studied. I never took an, even one English class in college, uh, but I read a lot. And that sort of inspired me to want to just write, and it was just a matter of practice. So there is... Uh, uh, there's no, you know, you don't have to have a literary background. You don't have to be the descendant of, of F. Scott Fitzgerald to become a writer. If you're a veteran and you have a story you want to tell, the key is just starting putting words on paper. And there are tools that, you know, you can be taught, you can learn that can make your writing stronger. Uh, again, if it is just a matter of wanting to get your story out of your head and onto paper, it's very therapeutic to do so. Um, and if you want to use it just basically as a memoir to share with your family, that's great. But again, there's great stories out there, stories untold, stories that need to be told. And if you go to US for Warriors, we have said have a mentorship program helping those uh, wannabe writers, those, 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 those veterans that want to have their stories published. That's awesome. James, you are getting amazing reception um, from our live feed, from our viewers right now. Um, and there's been a lot of questions, um, and I'm going to ask just a couple um, questions from our viewers. Sure. Um, we have one from Marisa. Um, she says, James, you've written under a couple of, I'm going to say pseudiums because she said it, it's very pretty, and I'm probably going to mess this up, but I'll try. Nom de plumes? Did I say that right? Yep. Nom de You yes. did. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I've always, wondered how, I've always wondered how authors choose their pen names. 
how much time does it take to research a book on average before you start writing? Oh, so a two in one question. Two questions there. Yes. Uh, for again, I, I, I've had a couple pseudonyms, uh, which gets confusing after a while between my real name, my pseudonym, the two pseudonyms that I wrote under, and I wrote under two pseudonyms. James Rollins is not my real name. My real name is James Tchaikovsky. When I sold my first book, the author, was, the publisher was like, "You know, your book's good, but that name's got to go." Uh, hard to spell, it's hard to pronounce. You know, give us something that's you know phonetically pronounceable that's two syllables. So Rollins came about because the University of Missouri Veterinary School that I attended was on Rollins Avenue. So it's a little nod oh, nice. back to my veterinary roots. And my other pen name was James Clemens, uh, and that's I borrowed uh, Mark Twain's unused uh, original name, Samuel Clemens. So again, it's a little nod to my Missouri roots, even with that other pen name. So uh, the weird thing is that both publishing houses, because they were published by two different publishing houses, that's why I ended up with two different pseudonyms. They said, it, you know, make it phonetically pronounceable and preferably two syllables. And I said, well, why two syllables? And both of them told me this. They said, well, one syllable is too, too uh, hard to remember. Three syllables is too hard to, it's too easy to forget. And I'm thinking, well, Stephen King does just fine. And, and you know, uh, <laughs> why can't I have one syllable? So the other question about the research was uh, I, uh, I, I have to limit my research. I love to research, but at some point it becomes I'm really playing more than I am working because I just am I'm following you know, different trails, to different areas of research. So now I, I limit myself to 90 days of research. And the 91st day, I have to actually start putting words on paper. Otherwise, I'll just keep researching and keep researching and keep researching. Nothing ever gets written. So 90 days of research, but the 91st day, I actually have to start putting words on paper. Very nice. Um, that's awesome. And then um, I'm going to, I think we have time for one more question. So this question is from Chris. Chris is asking, do you already know the ending of a book when you're writing it, or does it evolve? while you're writing um, There's you know, two different thoughts about how to write. There's the outliners, and then there's those that write from the seat of their pants. And I've attended panels where those two have been in discussion, you know, the panelists, those that write that from the seat of the pants, or those that outline. By the end of that pa panel, they're usually in a, in a fist fight because their minds are wired so differently. For me, I, I, I need to know the ending because when I do construct that roller coaster, I need to know where, that, uh, where it's gonna end. So I know the beginning, I know the end, I'll, I'll know a few tent poles that are going to hold up the story, but I don't necessarily know how A connects to B connects to C, because one of the joys for writing for me is that discovery along that path, to find out the way that story takes weird twists and turns. So I, I, I work from what I call a skeletal outline. I know the beginning, I know the end, a few stopping points in between, but that's about all I know when I begin to write. Uh, no, that's awesome. And everyone has their own way of doing it, which I think is awesome and keeps it all creative but you're getting so much love in the chats too everyone is so excited that you're here so we can't thank, thank you. you enough for being here again today thank you absolutely i, I got i got a couple i got a couple folks on my page as well uh nicole allen says thank you for showing us a part of your, that world and then um james massey had a huge thumbs up to usa care so uh, uh james is very familiar with that organization and also while you were talking i was trying to think of what my pen name should be so, um, <laughs> oh, this is a good, this is good. <laughs> I know. So Kevin, Kevin chat, how about Kevin chat? That, that'd be a good pin name, right? No, I'm, I don't know. I, I got to figure out something. No, but, um, yeah, second syllable. <laughs> right. Cause that, chat's that, one syllable. Chatty. Oh, work chat. Oh, is two syllable. <laughs> That is, that is. We gotta talk but listen, now. I, I gotta have, I gotta have an alias though. I gotta find the street, yeah. street name somewhere, or uh, some <laughs> random thing in my in my life that I need to make my last. What name about, so. what about Keesler Osby? Get it, Keesler? Oh Ooh. yeah, Keesler. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll figure like it out. It. I promise you. We'll circle <laughs> back on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. So, so we know you're you're gearing up for the Kingdom of Bones book tour. So, uh, fans can catch the first virtual stop on April the 18th. What can your readers expect from the conversation with your good friend and fellow writer Steve Barry? I expect Steve to see how well he can embarrass me. Uh, <laughs> our, our, we have a, a, 
relationship that goes back to the beginning of each other's career. I mean, we basically started in the trenches together. And, and so he knows my secrets. I know his secrets. And the question is, you know, how much will he reveal to embarrass me? <laughs> Look, there's no better friend than somebody that knows your where the skeletons are hid, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, so before we say goodbye, where can our viewers go to learn more about the virtual book tour stop, maybe sign up for that? And then how can fans follow you and keep up with all things James Rollins? Let's go to jamesrollins.com. It's my website. It's sort of the encyclopedia of James Rollins. It has all the information about the books, about the tour. Uh, there's a section for those that maybe want to write a Q&A. There's a section about you know how to help with USA Cares or US for Warriors. Uh, but if you want to the day in, day out of what James Ronalds is doing on a regular basis, what's happening with my dogs, what's happening with the family, uh, follow me on Facebook, Twitter. I'm spending way too much time on, on, on social media. I'd probably get another book done up per year if I just didn't, if I just ignored Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> Same, but don't tell my boss that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> and as a reminder, <laughs> Kingdom of Bones will be available on April 19th, tax-free, shopmyexchange.com, and in select exchange stores. And, and also, you know, for our Chief Chat viewers, you can view this episode uh, on YouTube and Spotify. You can rewatch with your friends or catch up with past episodes. Also, be sure to join us at 11 a.m. Central on April 21st as we welcome the Karate Kid and Cobra Kai star, Martin Cove, a.k.a. Mr. Sweep the Leg. Uh, uh, and, also, and also join us back again at 11 a.m. Central on April 26th when former first daughter Jenna Bush Hager joins the chat. So, so Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. You, uh, you've you've. I appreciate you sharing your book and, and and also kind of getting us really excited about this thriller. It, it sounds like you said it sounds a little something gonna keep us up at night, uh, but then you said we're gonna be crying at the end. So yeah, I don't know if my, my emotions are ready. To <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we need to take a couple of days off. <laughs> I I know I know, but no, we appreciate what you do. Uh, you know because. Your art, you, you sharing your art with the world does so much for our military community because, you know, we're dealing with, you know, we all deal with stuff going on in life. But, uh, you know, we we put our, our, our nation's warriors in harm's way and they just need a way to escape. And so we appreciate what you do uh, through your art form. I appreciate that. That's very kind. Awesome. And, and also, you know, all the organizations that you support for military uh, members. So uh, if you guys are watching, go check out the book. April 19th, uh, get it, get the digital, is there an audio version of that? Are you, are you talking, are you reading it to me if on the audio version? There is an audio version, but dear God, no, not me doing the audio. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't even, I don't even read chapters at a book talk. You know, I, I said, unless you can do yeah. funny voices, you should not be reading your own work. So I, I do not do that. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. But well, if you don't mind hanging on with to it, I mean, hanging on after the chat so we can kind of say our formal goodbyes. But again, thank you so much. We wish you all the best and uh, Chief Chat out.